Uh, Nina Zeiler is a postdoctoral researcher in the project uh, entitled Crisis and Communitas, and uh, her research focuses on the crisis of 1968 in Poland. Uh, she uh, wrote a PhD on feminist criticism uh, in Poland in the uh, 90s uh, and published, uh, which was published as a book, Privatized Feminity. Uh, she is uh, a board member of the Swiss Association of Feminist Studies uh, and also a member of a Polish gender society and chief editor of HAZ magazine, a quarterly uh, devoted to LGBTQ plus topics, which is based in Zurich. And she is going to present a paper uh, entitled Crisis of Communitas or the Extension of Our World. Around 1968, there was a crisis of communitas in the Polish People's Republic. Being in common became a threat and feelings of mistrust grew. How could culture, how could literature negotiate such a crisis when even to communicate was highly suspicious? Well, let me begin from the start. What I mean by a crisis of communitas around 1968 is a turn away from the communist idea of internationalist solidarity and towards an officially transported narrative of a national community. Even though internationalism was still part of the official agenda, the return of national communists with Władysław Gomułka as first party secretary after 1956 led to a gradual intensification and redrawing of geo- and biopolitical borders. March 1968 came to symbolically mark this turn in the ideological outline of Polish communism. During the 60s, voices, of reform for, um, voices for reform of the communist system were becoming louder, while the pressure of this very system against social and cultural freedoms grew. Around March 68, youth protests for a more liberal and tolerant system broke out, but were violently silenced by militia force. Also, there was an anti-Semitic campaign peaking in the years from 1967 to 1970. Poles of Jewish descent were accused of being Zionists, supporting the State of Israel in the context of the Six-Day War. They were said to be a destructive cosmopolitan force directed both against the socialist system and against the Polish national identity. Also, they were condemned as the alleged remnants of the Stalinist party elite oppressing the Polish nation for their own benefit. Anti-Semitic propaganda was most virulent shortly after the youth protests in March 68. In the media and in official party communiques, Poles of Jewish descent were made responsible for stirring the elitist student protest in order to sabotage communist Poland. In the context of these events, the authorities cut down on cultural and ideological freedom as well as personal freedom. They jailed key figures of the movement for reforms and expelled many students from their universities. Poles of Jewish descent were dismissed from their workplaces, from the party, and encouraged to leave Poland for Israel. In installing structural and social violence against Poles of Jewish descent, the party state intentionally set in motion mechanisms of ethnic division and exclusion. These mechanisms led to feelings of isolation and loss of control over social situations amongst the attacked. But also in general, due to the media manipulations around the March events, civil society grew insecure about the interpretation of the events they witnessed or heard about. Around 68, there was a definite split of realities in the Polish People's Republic. On the one hand, 
There was the official discourse, transporting narratives of hatred and exclusion, while at the same time keeping quiet about state violence. On the other hand, you have the experience of the people that doesn't correspond to this official image. But it was nonetheless influenced by it. Interacting and being common with the alleged Zionists and rebel rousers became a threat. Acts of solidarity with others were strongly discouraged. Mistrust both against the officials and against neighbors and colleagues increased. To sum up, the events around 68 in Poland can be termed as traumatic. The structural and social violence experienced by society was all untold and unspeakable. The new Polish national community was thus founded on a violent but silent rift through society. The official wordings, however, made language the main suspect of the post-68 years in Poland, as literary scholar Lidia Burska put it. After March 68, society could not believe in words anymore. In the theories of political philosophy about communitas, for example in Roberto Esposito's reasoning, a key role plays the element of munus as the semantic core of both communitas and immunitas. Munus can be understood as a gift we are not receiving, but are obliged to offer. It is the duty towards others. The fact of being in common puts us all in a network of mutual indebtedness <coughs> and as such questions the concept of the individual. Immunitarian mechanisms, however, are working to uphold self-unity and detachment of the individual. I would argue that in order to regulate the constant redistribution of munus, we are dependent on interaction and communication. Through communication, we both negotiate communitas, our being in common, and maintain immunitas the split between the self and the other. This communication can be verbal or non-verbal and consist in bodily gestures and practices. We are connected through constant communication, which is thus both a gain and a threat to the individual self. Also, verbal language is an effective structure and an instrument of bonding. Through language, people can understand each other and create um, connections. Language affects us by shifting our position and moving us closer to others. But of course, language can also be used to hurt and affect people negatively, creating distances and drawing borders. Language thus has an impact on us. It transforms ourselves in respect to others. Moreover, language is impressive and expressive. It has a normative effect, structuring our experience, and at the same time, at the same time, offers the opportunity to convey the singularity of experience. Around 1968 in Poland, language came to have a violently normative effect, whereas personal experiences were withdrawn to, to protect the speaker. In post-68 arts in Poland, the use of communicative script is highlighted, while the actual message transported is often depicted as a miss or lacking at all. Verbal communication had lost its communi communitarian quality. It, was, it wasn't able anymore to connect people, but rather isolated them from each other. The question is whether this communitarian approach could also be overcome. I will now discuss the function of, functioning of communication in Tadeusz Konwicki's novel The Anthropos Spectre Beast, or Zwierzo Człeko Upiór in Polish, uh, which was published in 1969. The book, so proficiently designed as a children's tale, is often seen as Konwicki's attempt to avoid the bad humors directed against him in the 1960s. Konwicki had turned away from socialist formalism and started to support the claims for more cultural freedom. In 1966, he was excluded from the Communist Party and began to have problems publishing his texts and films. Also in the Anthropospector Beast, the censors eliminated the most depressing passages. The tale told in the book is not a smooth, logical story. 
Many questions remain unanswered and character designs are unstable. What the narrator shows is often contradictory with what he tells. According to literary scholar Dorota Shibor, this is how Konitsky stages that nothing is as it seems, a hint at the fact that the words used do not correspond to the reality experienced. In the end, the reader finds herself misguided by the narrator again. She discovers that the whole story was made up by a child lying alone and dying in a hospital. This child had imagined multiple variants of himself and their respective lives to taste a bit of freedom from the pain. The lack of freedom is depicted as immobilizing illness, leaving only the thoughts vivid enough to create personal freedoms. If you retranspose this figure of thought to the situation around 68, it is an image of paralyzing social, political and cultural conditions working on the material body and deco decomposing it over time. But these conditions even manage to constrict the thoughts. The invented stories are gloomy and unable to conjure up positive human relations. What realism is in the anthropospective is, is the communication of the figures. In their conversations, they normally talk at cross purposes and cannot find a common language. The communicative dots cause the figures to never fully meet. They exist alongside each other, but the realities do not overlap. The only time we can find a sort of bonding or overcoming of the emotional split is when Piotr, that is the narrator, the child, reads the diary of his sister and there finds the marks of her tears. It's important that it's not the verbalized content in the diary, but the bodily expression or overflow of emotion that manages to affect our narrator. I quote, Here I found a few weird stains. These were tears, real tears from Miss Sophia, that's his sister, who is under her mask, who under her mask of cold indifference ter suffers terribly. I don't know why, but all of a sudden I felt enormously sorry for Miss Sophia. A similar situation happens when Piotr engages in a boxing match with one of his doppelgangers, a domineering and sinister young aristocrat. They find a common language in this physical engagement. Piotr, unused to boxing, instinctively, quoting instinctively, stretched out my arm, I heard a muffled crashing, and saw Troik falling on his back, unquote. However, Piotr's companion constantly interferes with uh, advice, and whenever Piotr listens to these words, he fails to keep up. The bodily communication seems to be a way to negotiate the figure's relations more successfully, but is commonly interrupted by verbal interference. Piotr discloses an emotional connection to two rather unexpected, unexpected beings in his neighborhood. One is a tree, the other one an invalid. invalid. Both of them do not really speak, but communicate by their mangled bodies. The tree, just like the invalid, had to be cut down in order to be kept alive. But apart from, quote, some old man with a pruning saw, unquote, nobody was able to read the tree's illness. When the invalid is haunted by the anthropospector beast, the neighbors try to avoid too much interaction. Quote, a neighbor with bristled up hair on his head presses him on the bed, and the invalid shouts with terrifying, non-human voice, he is here. And everybody from the house knows that the invalid is not able to call it by its name. They say goodbye quickly in a strange hurry, and cover their heads under their pillows, and pray for the invalid to get silent, for him not to remind, unquote. Piotr shows sympathy, even affection, towards these two beings discarded from society. Maybe this can happen precisely because they are unable to verbalize their suffering, and they are unable to use words and take part in the common language of violence directed against others. This hints at the possibility of looking past human borders on the quest for ways of bonding. Even in the term of the anthropospector beasts, from the novel's title, 
we encounter a conceptual conflation of beings I would like to call transhuman, or would, as we have heard before, Donna Haraway can also call transspecies. The anthropospector beast is an embodiment of the omnipotent force of paralyzing fear. It is imagined without image and transgresses the human mind and body and still haunts it. It is neither human nor animal nor ghost, but each of those at the same time. There are also other beings that are neither fully human nor are they strictly non-human. For example, the girl Eva from the past world visited by Piotr. She features some bodily traits transgressing the common human outline. Quote, I know I now saw her oval, oval eyes clearer, but they were vertically oval, not horizontally. And this gave a somewhat eerie impression. Unquote. Moreover, Eva's inconsistent life story feels puzzled together from snippets of a global colonial past. Eva wants the story as an incorporation of a multifaceted past that cannot come to rest in the present. And also the speaking dog Sebastian, Piotr's leader on the quest to free Eva and apparently the reincarnation of an old lord, oscillates in the border of the human and the non-human. Sometimes he talks, but sometimes he is fully dog and cannot be contacted by Piotr. The transhuman verbal interaction is unbound by the everyday communicative scripts and manages to come closer to the figure of the narrator. But still, it does not move him and remains rather meaningless to him. Piotr, in the end, gets abandoned by Eva and Sebastian without understanding their goals and the meaning of the quest. In the Anthropospector piece, we have one de depiction of an idealized community with a functioning uh, com communicative system. The diverse, multi-ethnic and slightly chaotic town life of the whale, the phantasmatical place of the pre-war past Piotr visits during the quest. But while we can hear different languages in joyful conversation, there is never a distinct content extract extractable from the common chatter. Quote again. There was a terrible crowd, a wild racket of drawn out pitiful calls, sudden outbursts of laughter, a squeaking of pipes. Unquote. This utopia has become immune to the presence of its visitor and leaves him isolated. It remains mute and distant to him and to us as well. <coughs> the impossible communication with the idealized community of the past, a living world of the dead, <coughs> enhances the depressing undertone of the rejected communication in the Warsaw life of Piotr, which is a dead world of the living. But in his Warsaw life, apart from the unsettling interaction with his social entourage, Piotr does have a stabilizing reference framework. The only context he has a certain belief in is the framework of scientific knowledge. I have to get along alone. I already read all the books in our home, Piotr tells us at the beginning. He boosts about his modern approach as compared to his father's beliefs. Quote, Today, the times are different. Father believed in wars, in storks bringing children. On St. Nicholas Day, he placed his boots at the stove. I dispose of modern knowledge. I read about the mathematical game theory, about gravity fields, about matter and antimatter, and so on, and so on. But at the same time, Piotr says about himself that because he knows everything, he might just as well already die. So when a planetoid is threatening to destroy all life on Earth, it seems more important to him to secretly boost his knowledge. I didn't butt into these conversations at all. Well, why would I have to explain that a planetoid is flying into our direction, not a comet or a meteorite? Unquote. This approach seems to suggest that if humankind is not able to negotiate social bonds anymore and functions only through immunitarian mechanisms and outbursts of violent language, then maybe it is better for this communicative form to be dissolved in neutral, emotionless formulas and computations. But unfortunately, even science fails to, 
trajectory of the planetoid was miscalculated and it missed Earth. Konvitsky's Anthropos Spectre Beast is a depressing novel on almost all levels. The narrator cannot seem to find any solace in bonds with living beings. <laughs> this is most obvious in situations of verbal communication, while bodily interaction seems to still be able to effectively connect its participants. In the light of the events of 1968, this reflects a deep mistrust and immunization against the verbal on every level and with every partner of interaction, extending even to the relation between narrator and reader. While the words still circulate, they are fended off because of their toxicity. This feels like a turn towards the material, the bodily and technological at the expense of the verbal culture. Maybe it is also a beginning of a post-humanist era, shedding the belief in the rationale of humankind.